Hello there. How's it going, everyone? Welcome to D&D Optimized, the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e. We crunch numbers, we theory craft, and we try to create a character that is as powerful as possible, I suppose, in-game for the role that we've chosen that character to take on in-game. Um, my name's Colby, and I'm super happy to have you, so thanks for being here. If you enjoy creating characters in Dungeons & Dragons almost as much as you enjoy actually playing the game, welcome home. This is where you belong, and so, again, thanks for being here. Happy to have you. A couple of quick announcements before I jump into the build this week. FYI, if you're watching this kind of relatively soon after I release it, um, I am taking next week off. It's spring break here and uh, my kids are out of school and so we're just gonna go um, on a little vacation and I could use a little break, frankly. Um, and so I apologize in advance that there's not gonna be a video next week, but when I come back, we're gonna have a ton of stuff. There's there's a lot of things kind of coming to a head right now. I'm, I'm working on some stuff I'm calling D&D University that's um, kind of aimed at um, people who don't know much about the game and trying to sort of get them up to speed as it were to help introduce them to the game and 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 make it so that maybe after watching them they could watch one of these episodes and it would all make sense to them so that's an attempt on my part to kind of uh, try and broaden my audience i suppose i'm going to be releasing some of those coming up soon we've also got our 10,000 subscriber gauntlet video that uh, we'll probably be hitting sometime in the next three or four weeks. And uh, so look to that again. For those who don't know, we're, we're going to do like a um, like a gauntlet where me and some of my friends are each going to pick a character, one of the builds that I've done before, and then kind of throw them into a refiner's fire, as it were, and have them face, you know, three or four encounters one after the other maybe with a short rest in between that my friend Corey is going to kind of dm for us so look for some announcements on that i think we're going to put a poll out and have you guys pick one of the encounters so that should be fun and then again probably in the middle of next month or towards the end of next month we should be um recording our actual play sessions which i know many of you have requested and putting those up online as well so um a lot of additional content coming your way and I kind of want a week off to take a breather and maybe prepare for it a little bit so anyway thanks for letting me do that and for having patience. Last announcement just in case you missed it I did an interview with Nerdarchy Dave over at Nerdarchy um, earlier today which is yesterday by the time I posted this. It was a lot of fun Dave is a great guy easy to talk to and uh, yeah it was just it was fun we just talked about D, D and our channels and and uh, lots of stuff so hopefully you might find it interesting feel free to check it out on the nerdarchy live youtube channel or um i'll try and post a link to it right there if you have not subscribed to the, the nerdarchy channels um you absolutely should they're great guys and they do great content so on to the build i have been wanting to do a beast barbarian pretty much ever since uh tasha's came out and every time I put it up as an option on the poll for what you guys want to see next, it, it doesn't do very well. <laughs> um, but they just seem really cool and fun and, and powerful. They get a lot of attacks. And there are ways to take advantage of a character that has a lot of attacks. And uh, so I wanted to try my hand on it. I figured I'm just going to do one this week. Hopefully you guys will enjoy it as much as I enjoyed making it because I had a lot of fun with it. I, I will be honest, I'm, I'm almost a little embarrassed at how much I agonized over this build and how to do it right. Or at least, you know, how to do it in a way that felt really powerful to me and fun. Back and forth on a lot of different things before I finally ended up, you know, picking a path and, and, and running with it. And, and it ended up making this character that uh, really has almost a sort of a horror flick or a slasher flick feel to the character, which, which was not intended, but also not unwelcome. It, it kind of, I guess I would say it really sort of has a, almost a Jekyll and Hyde type feel to it at the end of the day where on the one hand we have this raging bestial warrior in combat but then out of combat they become this um, sort of peaceful supportive healing 
type character, uh, which, you know, I think could lead to a lot of fun to play in game uh, as you role play, you know, maybe playing this character that has almost a sort of a split personality or something based on whether they're in combat or out of combat, raging or not raging. Maybe you could say that about every barbarian, but this one in particular. So anyway, you'll 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 progress through the campaign and and really evolve in a way that not a lot of characters get to, I think, which will be cool. I don't want to spoil it too much. So without any further ado, I present episode 34, The Spore Beast. Let's jump in. All right. At level one, for our class, we're choosing barbarian, of course. Um, for your race, I'm going to recommend variant human or custom lineage, uh, as I often do. Um, a feat, uh, there, there's one feat in particular that's very important for us for our damage out the, out the gate. And that's the main reason why I want to go this route. I'd probably go custom lineage. Um, I think it works out a little bit better for us stats-wise, plus Custom Lineage gets Dark Vision as an option, Variant Human does not, and that's really nice. If your Dungeon Master gives you a free feat at character creation, or you're just looking for an alternative, you're sick of playing Custom Lineage or Variant Human, I think my top recommendation is probably Mountain Dwarf. Um, you get a plus two to two ability scores, and we could really make good use of a plus two to two ability scores. Plus they get some nice little perks as well, so that's that's probably my, my top alt recommendation. For the free feat, assuming you go uh, custom lineage, for the free feat we are going to want to take dual wielder. Um, the dual wielder feat lets you, typically as you probably know, when you are wielding a melee weapon in each hand, uh, in order to get a bonus attack with with your other hand, um, you have to, they have to be light, right? If you take the dual wielder feet, they don't have to be light, and that's going to be important to us, as we will explain in a moment. But also, you get a plus one to your armor class, so that's always welcome. As for your abilities, assuming point by, as usual, um, I'm gonna say, you know, buy a 14 strength and then put your plus two there from custom lineage, so you're 16. And then go 14 con, constitution, 14 dex, and a 13 wisdom. That doesn't leave us with any other points um, if we're doing point by, so we will suffer from intelligence and uh, charisma. And uh, hopefully that won't be too damaging for you in your game. As for equipment. I, I recommend that we go the gold buy route and not take standard equipment. That way you should be able to afford scale mail and um, two battle axes. And why battle axes? Because we're a freaking barbarian. We're not some sissy longsword wielding knight, right? Plus battle axes are the cheapest D8 melee weapons you can get, I think. So anyway, battle axes are cool. They're very barbarian-esque. Also, as a barbarian at level one, you get rage, of course. And as most of you know, rage is awesome. You rage as a bonus action. And then as long as you are raging, it lasts for a minute, you do an extra two damage on your strength-based uh, attacks, melee attacks. And you also are resistant to all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, which is huge. That is really the majority of the damage that most characters in D&D will take. And so having resistance is gonna be very nice. It's gonna be very important for us, especially. Keep in mind that you lose your rage if you go a full round without either making an attack or taking damage. So be sure to have a javelin or something on hand that you know if you're not in melee range of somebody, you can at least make a thrown weapon attack. Even if it doesn't hit anybody, doesn't matter. You will still be able to maintain your rage. For now, you get two of them per long rest, uh, but that will go up in a little bit. The last thing as a level one barbarian you get is the unarmored defense feature. And this is a little bit of a trap for us. What it does is it lets you apply both your constitution modifier and your dexterity modifier to your armor class if you're not wearing any other armor. Um, that seems kind of nice, but you know, for us right now, that's just a plus two for con, plus two for dex, so 14 total would be our armor class. We could wear scale mail, and that gives us a 14 to start with, add our dex modifier of plus two, and now we're at a 16. So we're actually going to be making use of this probably um, a little bit later, but for now, stick with the scale mail. At level two, 
um, barbarians get reckless attack, which is one of the best damage increase abilities in the game, as far as I'm concerned. You choose at the beginning of your turn to attack recklessly, and then you get advantage on all of your attacks that you make that turn. It's very strong. Now, of course, it comes at a cost. You give your enemies advantage when they attack you until the beginning of your next turn. So obviously that's a pretty hefty drawback to our, uh, you know, our, our survivability goes down significantly, but um, I think it's a worthy trade-off, particularly because, you know, we, we have a lot of hit points compared to pretty much any other character, and we have resistance to most of the damage that we're going to be taking in-game. It's, it's, it's worth doing. Danger Sense is another feature that uh, Barbarians get at level 2, and it's nice. It, uh, it gives you advantage on dexterity saving throws when you can see the, the thing that you have to make a dex save against, right? Um, that's particularly nice for us because we don't have proficiency in dexterity saving throws. At level 2, we're actually a, a very, very strong character. I would almost say one of, if not the strongest, level 2 characters you can, you can make. I mean, we get two attacks per turn with d8 weapons. We get advantage on those attacks, uh, plus our rage damage bonus. And we have a decent armor class uh, for level 2 especially. I mean, you know, we've got uh, 14 for our armor, plus 2 for dex, plus 1 for the dual wielder feat. So that's a 17. Pretty good for level 2. And again, you know, resistance to just about any damage we'll take and, and more hit points than probably any other character unless somebody went with like a really high constitution character out the gate or whatever. In fact, let's do a damage report against a 10 armor class. At this level, we would be averaging 16 damage per round, sustainably, right, without spending any resources. That will kill most things that you're fighting at this level in a single turn. And you're pretty tanky to boot, just saying. So, at level 3. At level 3, barbarians get to take their subclass, um, their, uh, their primal path. And we are, of course, going Path of the Beast. This is what it says in the book. Barbarians who walk the path of the beast draw their rage from a bestial spark burning within their souls. That beast bursts forth in the throes of rage, physically transforming the barbarian. I like to think of him as a werewolf. It doesn't have to be a werewolf. Such a barbarian might be inhabited by a primal spirit or descended from shapeshifters. You can choose the origin of your feral might or determine it by rolling on the origin of the beast table. And there's this table that you get to choose your origin from. My favorite is, uh, for this build especially, is that you are descended from an arch druid. But obviously, take what you want for your story. So, Form of the Beast tells us this. When you rage, you transform, manifesting a natural weapon. It counts as a simple melee weapon. That's important. Remember that. Um, you use your strength modifier to hit and to damage, and you choose the form that this natural weapon takes. You can either choose uh, your mouth, your you grow a tail, or your hands turn into claws. So with the mouth, um, it lets you make a bite attack that heals you if you're low on hit points. I wonder if that could stack with the new unarmed or unearthed arcana dampier bite attack. I have to look at that. That could be kind of cool. The tail gives you a d8 weapon with reach, so you can make a melee attack from 10 feet away, right? Which is nice, but the, the really nice thing about it is it kind of functions as like a poor man's shield spell. So as a reaction, when you get hit, you could sort of use your tail to help deflect the hit. You'd roll a d8 and then subtract whatever you roll uh, from, or sorry, add whatever you roll to your armor class for that one attack, potentially causing it to miss. The only thing that I don't love about it is, unlike the shield spell, it only it's only for that one attack, right? It doesn't last for like until your turn. So not quite as good, but it does make me wonder if you couldn't potentially come up with some sort of high armor class barbarian tank build, especially coupled with beast or bear totem, that would be really tanky. Anyway, um, Finally, we've got the claws, and that's what we are going to be focusing on. So with claws, each of your hands transforms into a, you know, into a, a claw, and, and we're told they, they do 1d6 slashing damage, and 
they count as um, they count as simple melee weapons. That's like I say, that's important. When you take the attack action, it says, and you attack with one, you can make an additional attack. Okay, cool. So we get two attacks. Um, the problem with claws, like I've said, is that they are simple melee weapons. They are not light weapons. So even though your hands are empty, for some reason, they are heavier than if you were to be holding a short sword. I guess they must be really long claws or, or something. Maybe you're Wolverine. I don't know. I, I know. The term light here just, you know, is simply used to describe a game mechanic, um, but it still seems a little silly. And I might, if I were trying to build this character, I might ask for, you know, a house ruling here for my DM to say, look, can, can we consider these light weapons? My hands are empty. In that case, you wouldn't need to take the dual wielder feet. And I might then ask, you know, I might take a different feat, maybe slasher um, to let you start with an 18 strength out the gate plus slasher. I mean, come on, it's totally on point. Anyway, we are going rules as written, so we needed to take the dual wielder feet so that we could wield our claws, right? And thereby make a bonus action attack. Essentially, we can two weapon fight now with our claws, right? So we would make one attack, and then because we're attacking with our claws, we get a second attack. And then because we have the dual wielder feet, we can make a bonus action third attack with our other hand. Um, three claw attacks every round without expending any resources at level three. That's really good. And even though they're only D6s, that's really good. They, we get to add our rage bonus to each attack. Granted, the other hand attack doesn't get to add our strength bonus because we, didn't, we don't have the two weapon fighting style. We might get that later. Anyway, that's, uh, that's one mean werewolf. So at level four, we get uh, an ASI or a feat, ability score increase that is, or a feat. Um, I'm gonna recommend that we bump our strength. So your strength is now an 18. At level five, we get extra attack. So you now have four attacks, four attacks per turn, every turn. As far as I know, the only other character that's, that's getting four attacks per turn at level five without expending any resources is somebody having casting haste on them, but, but that's a very high valuable resource that requires concentration, right? You know, action surge, but again, uh, limited resource. So you use no resources. You're kind of a, the pinnacle, I feel, of, of true sustained damage per round. Good for you. At level six, we are a druid level one. You have developed um, an increased desire to learn more about the arch druid who you are descended from, or maybe just to learn more about the nature of the beast that lies within you. Um, maybe you're trying to find a cure for your bestial nature. Maybe you're trying to sort of find ways to augment it by studying and getting to know beasts and nature better. I don't know. Why Druid? Other than for really cool story and thematic reasons, um, it will make sense, a lot of sense uh, in a minute. But for now, just trust me, go with me on this. So as a level one Druid, we get a couple of things. We get uh, Druidic, which is a language, essentially. It's uh, it's like Thieves' Cant, but for Druids. It's it's Thieves' Cant, but with sticks and leaves. <laughs> um, you, uh, I, I need to mention, you cannot wear metal armor now as a Druid. There are some DMs that allow it, but generally speaking, you can't wear metal armor. Um, and this actually hurts a lot. The, the best we can do now, uh, I believe, is hide armor which is only a 12 armor class. So 12 AC, 12 AC plus our decks of two, um, plus one for dual wielder feet, puts us at a 15 armor class instead of 17 where we were before. That's a real bummer. Coincidentally, it's the same that we would have if we went naked, right? Uh, because we get our con modifier, dex modifier, plus the dual wielder, we'd be at a 15 either way. So for me, I'm going naked. Throw a loincloth on at least, please. Um, but uh, it just feels more feral, more more thematic, I think. Of course, you may find you know some magical hide armor, in which case I definitely wear that. Um, we may be bumping our constitution later though, and that could outpace regular hide armor. So anyway, 
there's options just be aware of what they are you know again on the other hand you could get you could find some bracers of defense which would give you a plus two to your armor class if you're not wearing armor so in that situation you'd be, you'd be better off going with the unarmored defense just yeah know know the mechanics and uh pick what's best for you we get spells uh, as a druid level one and the problem of course with being a barbarian who can cast spells is that you can't cast or concentrate on spells while you are raging. That is the biggest drawback to the Barbarian and the thing that that I chafe the most at when I consider using them for, you know, a dip in, in one of my builds. Um, so I think the best use of your spells here is to really try and find stuff that's great primarily outside of combat, right? This can this can actually do a lot to bring a lot of fun and utility and usefulness uh, to a character who, let's be honest, can potentially be a little boring to play, in combat at least, especially. In my experience, when you play a character who their thing is, I just hit stuff all the time, it can get a little repetitive. Um, you may not feel that way. And so I like the, the fact that we start to kind of um, go through this metamorphosis almost as, as this character. And sure, our combat is still pretty much, I hit stuff, but you get outside of combat and now, you know, you've got these great cool utility and support type options. So recommended spells would be things like Guidance. Um, that's a great way to give a little utility buff um, to ability checks. They usually take, outside of, take place outside of combat, that's why I say utility. Um, mending can be really useful. Um, mold earth, shape water, also really useful. Uh, cure wounds, always a great option to, to do a little extra out of combat healing. Uh, or maybe if you know a player goes down and uh, you need to bring them back. Um, detect magic and detect poison. Ritual spells, wouldn't take a spell slot, can be really handy and uh, useful. Give you some nice utility. P purify food and drink, same thing if you're worried about getting poisoned. Basically, all of those spells that, you know, you wish you could take with other spellcaster builds, um, but you don't ever have room for them because you need to take some spells that are actually good in combat, right? It's kind of a, it's kind of a breath of fresh air. It's kind of a relief to uh, almost like a burden lifted, right? You don't have to worry about having good spells in combat. You can just take all of those fun, cool, useful spells um, that give you nice utility and support options. Um, instead of having to worry about combat spells. So anyway, there's there are tons of options. Let's do a damage report at level six. Against an enemy with a 10 armor class, you would be averaging 35 damage per round. That's making four attacks, um, adding your strength bonus to three of them, um, and your rage bonus to all of them. It's a plus two, and uh, all of those attacks are made with advantage. Your DPR versus a an enemy with a 15 armor class would be 31. So pretty good. Not best in class, but quite good. At level 7, we are a druid level 2, um, and we get the wild shape feature, which is a quintessential druid feature. It lets us transform into a beast of a, right now, a challenge rating 1 quarter and it cannot that beast cannot have flying or swimming speed we can do that twice per short rest um, it's it, potentially some nice utility but we are actually going to be using our um, wild shape primarily for something else we get uh, a wild companion is a, an option that was introduced in tasha's uh, as an action you can cast find familiar using one of your um, uses of wild shape you know if this lasted more than a number of hours times one half of your druid levels I, I would say it would be really nice for us we're probably just not going to be using it much it'll be a nice to have utility type thing especially if you need to um, scout out a dungeon and, and like see through your familiar's eyes and things like that but otherwise probably not a lot of use for us now, at level two, druid, you get your druid subclass, your druidic circle, and we are going, as you've probably guessed, the circle of spores. For some reason, though you are kind of all about the beast and descended from an arch druid, you found yourself becoming increasingly fascinated in and interested in um, death, the life cycle, um, and even undeath. So here's the thing about um, going barbarian. 
finding ways to sustainably add damage to each attack outside of concentration spells for any class is not particularly easy. Rage is one, right? Um, Blood Hunter rights, if your DM lets you play with unofficial content, is one. Um, you know, there's probably a couple others that I'm not thinking of, but there's not a lot. And for us, finding ways to add damage to each and every attack is paramount because we're doing a lot of attacks, but we are not necessarily hitting super hard with each of those attacks, right? You know, we, we, we're not using the, the great weapon master and sharpshooter feats of the world. We can't get Hunter's Mark or Hex or Spirit Shroud or any of those concentration-based spells that add damage to every attack. And so, you know, we need something in order to, to bump our damage. Thus, enter the Circle of Spores Druid. Two features here that you get. You get the Halo of Spores feature which tells us that when a creature moves within 10 feet of us, we, we have these invisible spores that, that sort of surround us in a 10-foot circle. And when a creature first enters into that 10-foot circle, as it were, um, or if they start their turn there, they will take damage. Um, you, you can use your reaction to cause them to take damage. It's just 1d4 necrotic damage right now. It will scale with druid levels. And they get to make a con save to resist this damage. And if they make it, they take no damage. It's not half damage. And, and so this is kind of nice, but it's not real strong for us. A, a lot of monsters uh, have a, a good plus to con save. Um, and our spell save DC is not particularly good. It's based on our wisdom. So right now it's a 12 and it'll only go up with our proficiency bonus. So that's not going to be a ton of damage. I am going to, I am going to add it to our um, sustained damage numbers when I'm crunching the numbers, but I will account for, you know, the fact that it's going to be resisted often and, and try and account for, um, you know, a creature spell save. Uh, or sorry, yeah, their con save versus our spell DC, right? We'll get a little damage out of it, a little mileage. The main reason we're here is for the second circle of spores feature, and that is symbiotic entity. As an action, you use your wild shape, and you awaken these invisible spores that surround you. For 10 minutes from then on, for 10 minutes, you gain four temporary hit points per druid level, that's important. And also, let's see, when you do your Halo of Spores damage, it, you actually roll two dice, so it's 2d4 now when you do that Halo of Spores damage. Um, and again, that will scale a little bit. The main benefit, though, is that um, from now on, your melee weapon attacks, well, sorry, while you have the symbiotic entity activated, your melee weapon attacks deal an extra 1d6 of damage to any target they hit. It's not a spell. It does not require concentration. So it is one of the only ways that we can stack um, like sustainable extra damage per hit on top of what we've already got. The problem with Spore Druid that I've really kind of agonized over a little bit is that once they got out of Unearthed Arcana and into official content with Tasha's, um, they, they tied this feature to the temporary hit points that you gain as uh, when, when you activate your symbiotic entity. And as soon as those temporary hit points are gone, you lose any benefit that you gained from symbiotic entity. And it really, really hurt this subclass. <laughs> um, because you know you've it, it kind of shackles you to the spore druid you have to continue to put levels into spore druid if you want to realistically hold on to that extra damage that you've gained right something i learned the hard way when i did my uh, grappler monk build whoops, whoops. you know maybe if they let that symbiotic entity extra damage um apply for any attack, like even ranged weapon attacks, it might be a little more feasible as kind of a, a, a druid multi-class dip, but it has to be melee attacks. So the only way to really make it work, I think, is either by putting it on a build that has a super high armor class and, and you can sort of rely on not getting hit very often, or at the very least that has a way to resist damage and continues then to take more druid levels um, so that you can get more temporary hit points and thereby sort of 
be able to rely on them lasting. And so the result is that we end up with this character who really feels like a true almost hybrid. They have they have two phases of their character development, right? The, the early phase where they're focused on being a barbarian and growing their sustained damage per round, and then sort of a second phase where they really kind of focus more on tankiness and support. They kind of have, uh, like I said, almost this this split personality disorder. Um, because because if they don't invest in being more tanky and taking more druid levels and getting more temporary hit points, then they're going to lose a big chunk of that sustained damage per round that they've worked so hard up until this point to attain, right? So you keep stacking druid levels from here and thereby increasing our temporary hit points and actually being able then to hold on to that extra damage from spore druid that that we came here for in the first place you know our damage sort of plateaus a little bit here um there's still ways to increase it and we'll explore them um but on the flip side our tankiness and our support and utility features and functionality really increase from here and so i don't know it's it's pretty cool pretty different Here's the good news, um, and the reason why I think Spore Druid actually works well with Barbarian, despite this kind of weakness, and it's because that unlike Arcane Ward, hmm, um, temporary hit points do in fact benefit from damage resistance. So more than, I think, perhaps any other class, the Barbarian can really stretch these temporary hit points that you're gaining from Spore Druid and thus hold on to the Spore Druid benefits you know, longer than, than really any other uh, build might be able to. Admittedly, you'd get even more mileage probably out of the temporary hit points as a bear totem barbarian, but you wouldn't do as much damage because we get all those attacks from the beast barbarian, right? Again, the vast majority of the damage that monsters and Dungeons and Dragons do is comes in the form of slashing, uh, bludgeoning, or piercing. And so, you know, those four hit points per level for us, more often than not, are going to feel like eight. And so again, really increasing our tankiness and really letting us hold on to these sport druid benefits. That was a bit of a, of a, a long exposition, I know. At level eight, we are a druid three and we get second level spells. Um, there's lots of great options here, again, for like utility and support. We can't pick something that's gonna require a concentration unless we're only gonna concentrate on it outside of combat, right? Dark vision's great if you went variant human or some other race that doesn't have dark vision. It lasts eight hours, um, doesn't require concentration. You could cast it on one of your allies too, for that matter, if they need it. That's very nice. Um, find traps is a fantastic utility spell, especially if your party's light on rogues. Um, locate object. I almost always wish at some point in every campaign of D&D I've ever played that I had the locate object spell, right? Um, now you can get it. Uh, pass without a trace is is great. It lets you really kind of ensure that your party can all succeed on their stealth checks if you're trying to be stealthy and get somewhere together as a group. Protection from poison is great. It lasts a while. It doesn't require concentration. Lots of good options. At level nine, you are a druid four. You get uh, another ability score increase or feat. And I would recommend that you bump your strength again. So now we're capped at a 20 strength. Also, our wild, our wild shape feature allows us to transform into a beast at one half challenge rating or lower um, and can swim, still can't fly. But that could be handy uh, depending on your campaign and, and uh, what needs you may have. Level nine damage report against an enemy with a 10 armor class. You are going, to, oh, and I plus zero to their constitution save. You're going to average 57 damage per round and against an enemy with a 16 armor class and a plus six to their constitution save, uh, you are going to average 51 damage per round. So pretty good. That is, uh, that, that compares quite favorably to like other sustained damage per round builds that I've done. Um, and has a lot more tankiness than most, if not all, of those, right? So um, yeah, at this point we're getting an extra 16 temporary hit points to uh, when we when we use our spore druid wild shape feature, right? And again, considering we're resistant to most damage, that's going to feel more like 32 extra hit points, and that's quite a bit. And you should be able to hold on to that. Um, most combat encounters, I would say, especially because you could recast it. You remember you get two castings that is of um your wild shape feature per short rest so uh, you know I, I think that 
more often than not, you should be able to hold on to those temporary hit points most of the time, not all of the time. And of course, when you lose it, your damage will go down, but um, you'll have soaked up a lot of damage in the meantime and helped your party in that way. So nothing to be sad about. At level 10, I want to go back to Barbarian for just a minute. There's a feature that Beast Barbarians get uh, called Bestial Soul. And it basically, it lets your attacks be magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance. I think this is really important to have. Um, we, we don't, we're not using any other weapons, right? We're just using our claws. And so if they're not considered magical, that could really hurt when you run into monsters that have resistance to non-magical attacks. So um, you might even need to take this a little bit earlier, depending on your campaign and what kind of monsters your dungeon master is having you fight. Anyway, take it at some point and probably by now if you haven't yet. We also, though, with uh, with Bestial Soul, get some uh, some cool little utility perks. So um, every short or long rest, you can choose an additional benefit um, from your transformation that will last until your next rest. So um, you can take, you can get like a climbing benefit that lets you climb equal to your walk speed, and you can even climb on like uh, upside down on ceilings, which is super cool and really thematic for this kind of creepy werewolf horror pick uh, creature that you're playing as here. Um, you get, uh, you could do jumping as a benefit instead, which lets you extend your jump distance uh, equal to an athletics check roll, um, or swimming. Um, it lets you swim uh, equivalent to your walking speed and uh, let you breathe underwater. So that'll be huge in, in certain situations, right? At level 11, we'll go back to Druid and we're gonna stay there for the rest of this character's career. So we get level three spells. The spell magic obviously is a, is a no-brainer choice here, but um, there are some other fun and useful ones. Um, you know, how many times in a campaign did you wish that you had water breathing, or that someone in your party had water breathing and nobody did, right? Uh, and now you can get it and and give it to your companions and or um, you know you could you could do the water breathing feature on yourself from your from your beast barbarian and then cast water breathing on somebody else, which is nice. Um, I really hope you have a DM that gives you an opportunity to take advantage of all of these cool, useful utility type spells that you're picking up. Now, as a spore druid, you also get a little feature, Animate Dead. Um, sorry, a spell, the spell Animate Dead that's not, uh, that other druids don't get, right? And I'm actually gonna use this and depend on it for, for some damage increase. Um, it works, I think, really well thematically for this creature who is sort of very interested in and or at least not afraid of undeath. It takes one minute to cast, and when you do so, you raise either a skeleton or a zombie from a pile of bones or a corpse. Um, now, the creature is under your control for 24 hours, and it does not require concentration. After 24 hours, you have to either recast the spell to maintain control, or you just let it wear off and they become an uncontrolled skeleton or zombie and they're probably going to attack you and you'll have to kill them. Now, it says you can use a bonus action to command them to do something, but it also says you can issue a general command that they will continue trying to follow. So I don't know why you couldn't just make that command on, you know, you raise it and then the first bonus action is, you know, attack the things that I attack or, or something like that. Um, I don't know why that wouldn't work. Discuss it with your DM just to make sure that uh, that they're in agreement with you and that this can function like you want it to. But assuming that uh, it can work this way, it will give us a, a little bump to our sustained damage. Um, you know, naturally skeletons are fairly easy to kill. They only have a 13 armor class and a 13 and 13 hit points, but they they can make a short bow ranged attack you know up to 80 feet away so you could you you should be able to i think keep your skeleton safe you know keep them back keep them behind your your companions and behind yourself um hopefully your dm won't just target them and take them out but if they do hey at the very least you've provided a lot of great damage soak for your party and kept your party safe so still worth it uh, i think um, you might, depending on your DM, you know, your DM might make you like pack a bunch of short bows to give to these skeletons. They, they might not just raise up with a short bow in hand. I don't know, again, something you'll have to work out with them. If need be, 
grab a bunch of short bows in town and, and a few quivers of arrows. <laughs> At level 12, you are a druid six, uh, and you get, as a spore druid, the feature called fungal infestation. Um, we are really doubling down on the undead theme here with the spore druid. So here's how this feature works. When a small or medium humanoid or beast dies within 10 feet of you, uh, you can use your reaction to reanimate it. Um, and you raise yourself up a zombie. So now you've got skeletons and zombies. Um, it only lasts for an hour, and most importantly, it only has one hit point. So, you know, it, it takes its turn right after yours. It doesn't require your action or bonus action or anything to do it. It will obey you, it'll make an attack. I don't think we can really count this towards our sustained DPR. Um, it will likely do very little damage. It will likely die very quickly. But again, even if it does, and if, and if it takes up an enemy, uh, an enemy attack, it's probably worth using. Um, you do only get to use it number of times per day uh, equal to your, your uh, wisdom modifier, and for us that's just one. So yeah, again, not really sustainable damage per round that we're going to include here, but a nice little to have feature that you can use once in a while. Also, our Halo of Spores damage goes up to a d6 from a d4. And for us, generally that's gonna be 2d6 because we're always gonna have our symbiotic entity uh, active, right? At level 13, you are a druid seven. You get level four spells. Uh, I highly recommend freedom of movement. Um, it, again, it doesn't require concentration. Uh, it lasts for an hour. And it really helps you to like not be affected by difficult terrain and get out of, of a number of, or or an ally get out of a number of controlled statuses that's great it only lasts an hour so you kind of need to cast it before going into combat you might not always be able to sort of time that right but um, it, it could be a really good utility to have uh, depending on the fight for number crunching purposes i am going to assume that you are using your fourth level spell slot here uh, to upcast animate dead because we get an extra two skellies for every spell level that we upcast it. So for, for at a fourth level spell slot, it would be three skeletons, um, and that's a that's a nice little bump to our sustained damage per round. And now you're like a werewolf with a skeleton army. So this is just a, you know a total horror movie ensemble that you've that you've got going here, and I love it. And I want to play this next Halloween. <laughs> All right, damage report at level 13 versus a 10 enemy armor class who has a plus zero to their constitution save. You're averaging 71 damage per round. And against a 17 armor class with a plus seven to their con save, um, it is 58 damage per round. So again, looking really quite good. And at this point, we have a very healthy 28 temporary hit points. Um, from our symbiotic entity at this point, which again is going to feel more like 56. Um, so that's quite nice for our tankiness and survivability. All right, coming down the home stretch. At level 14, you are a Druid 8, and you get another ability score increase or feat. <sighs> we might really want to take a bump to our constitution here. It would help our armor class, unless we have magical hide armor. Um, and our hit points, of course, and our con saves and all of those things. I'm trying to stretch our damage, and so I'm going to recommend Fighter Initiate and to take the two-weapon fighting style because we've gone this whole time without being able to apply our strength modifier to that other hand attack that we're making with our two-weapon fighting claws, right? And it'd be really nice to get an extra five damage per turn out of those claw attacks. So that's what we're going to do. Um, you don't have to, of course. Do what you want. We're taking that for damage. We get an improvement to our wild shape, which gives us the ability to transform into a beast of challenge rating one or lower, and it can now have flight. So uh, there will be some times where you'll be really excited about turning into an eagle or a hawk or something. And, and flying around and doing cool flying things. At level 15, we are a Druid 9. Um, we get fifth level spells, and there are a lot of great out of combat options here. Um, Gius, Gius, Gaius, <laughs> charms someone and uh, harms them if they disobey you. That's fantastic, right? 
uh, greater restoration is is really good to cure all sorts of um, conditions and diseases and things. Mass cure wounds can be nice in a pinch, you know, between combat sessions if you don't have time to rest or you're low on hit dice or whatever, and 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 you know, give everybody a little oomph to to for the for the next fight. Scrying uh, basically lets you spy on someone. These are all great and and kind of obvious choices. The one I feel I have to talk about for a second is Awaken. Awaken seems at first glance to be really powerful. It takes eight hours to cast it, um, but it doesn't require concentration once cast. And then when you cast it, you awaken a tree or even a beast that's huge or smaller. That's okay. Um, you give it intelligence, and it can now speak a language that you know, and it is charmed by you for 30 days, and maybe longer depending on how you treat it during that 30-day time period. If you awaken a tree, it will probably have the stats of an awakened tree, which is this challenge rating 2 creature, um, subject to DM discretion, but that's most likely what most DMs will choose for you, I think. Um, it, that's pretty powerful for a non-concentration spell, right? And of course, if you charm a beast, it could be huge or greater. There's no challenge rating limit given here. I mean, it could be a T-Rex or a giant ape, theoretically. Here's the problem. First off, I have no way of knowing what beast you may or may not come across in your travels, let alone if you'd be able to subdue it for eight hours while you cast this spell on it, right? Um, so trying to account for that somehow in the numbers feels like uh, a bit of a fool's errand. The Awakened Tree, on the other hand, feels a lot more plausible, a lot more reliable, and more calculable, because I just kind of know the stats, right? Um, and I think for that reason, a lot, of people, a lot of people, a couple people anyway, gave me crap for not using this in my Pokemon Trainer build. Here's the thing. There's nothing in the spell description that says that the awakened creature has to do what I say, or that it fights for me in combat, or anything like that. All it says is that it is charmed by me. If something's charmed, it means it can't attack me, and that's nice, and then it means that I have advantage on like ability checks to socially interact with that creature. So sure, you could try to persuade it to fight for you and be your little tree ant pet and risk life and limb for you for the next 30 days, but I have no idea what the difficulty check of that will be as per your DM. And you have a crap charisma, so even if you have advantage on trying to persuade them to do that, there's no guarantee that it'll work, right? If you want a pet tree ant, and who wouldn't? Because, come on, that would be awesome. You know, Talk this over with your DM, see if you might be able to make it work. I don't feel like I can assume that you're just going to get a, like a pet awakened tree simply by casting this spell. If you can, you're going to be a lot more powerful than I'm assuming. So, you know, if you can make it work, congratulations. That's awesome. Anyway, consider it and talk it over with your DM. At level 16, you are a druid 10. You get a, an ability called Spreading Spores, and it's totally lame, especially for us, but even even for someone with a high wisdom score, I feel like it would be pretty lame. Um, as your bonus action, you can hurl your spores, so instead of surrounding you in, in a 10-foot circle, you can hurl them up to 10, uh, sorry, 30 feet away, but it still just makes a 10-foot cube, and then any creature that first enters it or that starts its turn inside is gonna take your spores damage. If they fail, they're safe. Uh, which, against us, they're not going to do very often. And it's just not great. Even if they fail their save, it's, it's well, right now, your, your Halo of Spores does go up at this level to a 1d8. And again, for us, since we're using our symbiotic entity all the time, it's a 2d8, but you know, it's just not a lot of damage. I, don't, I can't imagine ever using my bonus action to throw my spores. At level 17, you are a Druid 11, and you get level six spells, and again, um, there are so many great out of combat options. Um, heal will straight up heal someone for 70 hit points. Um, find the path will trivialize any sort of you're lost, you don't know where to go moment in your campaign. Hero's Feast is so good, I just used it um, right before a dragon fight that we had in our campaign. 
uh, last week. Um, you know, you give the whole party temporary hit points, advantage on wisdom saving throws, and immunity to fear for 24 hours. So, Dragon's Frightful Presence, meh. Um, really good in certain situations, especially transport via plants lets you teleport all your whole party all over an entire world as long as there's trees where you're going and where you are, right? Uh, Windwalk lets you turn your whole party into clouds and fly around. I mean, there's just some great, fun, cool, useful spells here that you get to use and and really do 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 good by your party. Of course, for number crunching purposes, I'm taking the most boring and impractical assumption that uh, we're going to use our six level spell slot to summon six skeletons uh, to fight for us in combat, which you should almost assuredly not do. <laughs> but we are exploring the limits of what is possible for sustained damage, so here we are. If you go this route, right, and, and regardless, if and when you do have these skeletons, try and make sure you spread them out so they can't just get blown up by a single fireball spell, right? keep them at range, hopefully they'll be able to survive and uh, really do the damage that they were intended to do. But again, at the very least, even if they're soaking damage, that's still nice. So final damage report um, versus an enemy with 10 armor class and a plus zero to their constitution saving throw. You will do, and again, I am assuming the skeletons, but they don't add a ton. They add some, especially if there's seven of them. Uh, you will do 95 damage per round, and again on average, and against an enemy with an 18 armor class and a plus 8 to their constitution saving throw, it's still good. It's 71. Add on top of that the 44 temporary hit points that you that you get from your symbiotic entity, your druid levels, that again is going to feel more like 88 hit points most of the time, and, and that you can reapply in combat if need be, assuming that you know you can take short rests regularly, that gives you a possible total hit points of 212. And you have a 14 constitution. You haven't done anything to increase like your hit points or tankiness this whole time, right? Other than, of course, taking these druid levels and the temporary hit points. Just by comparison, if I were to compare this build to um, other tank builds that I've done, like at this level against, you know, our boss fight, which was an adult red dragon, your rounds to die would be eight, which is almost as good as the Bear Totem Barbarian um, tank build that I did. But add to that that, as of this recording anyway, this build just became our new, like, number one tier two for damage per round, sustained damage per round. So they're really good um, for sustained damage. And then they also like have great tankiness, great support and utility features and stuff. So, so I don't know, um, pretty powerful. Speaking of the sustained damage per round um, builds and tiers, FYI, for those paying attention, and again, you can find the graphs, the links to the graphs and things in the in the video description. Um, the ranged fighter and the eldritch sorcerer, who were previously at tier two, got bumped up to tier one because tier two is getting a little crowded. So anyway, check that out if graphs and spreadsheets are something that you're interested in. So final thoughts. Um, you know, I actually really love how this build turned out. Um, at first I sort of chafed at the like golden handcuffs that the Spore Druid kind of puts on you, right? It's like, I'm gonna give you this great benefit of this extra damage, but you can really only enjoy it if you continue to invest in more Spore Druid levels. So it's like, this is great, but I can't get out. I wouldn't have minded the damage so much if uh, if it scaled a little bit better, but you know, we found ways to, to still keep it scaling and, and really make it fairly strong and, and then, as I continued to think about it, write about it, consider all the different spell options and, and uh, you know features and things, I've, I've really come to love the, the metamorphosis. Um, like I said, sometimes martial characters can feel a little stale and repetitive, I feel like, in game. And even, even when you're hitting stuff a lot and hitting it really hard, which we do, this character sort of gets to have their cake and eat it too. By hitting stuff a lot, pretty hard, and then, you know, especially during the first half of their journey, and then during the second half of the journey, almost kind of adding this other aspect to their character, which is this sort of hard to kill, but also 
um, great support and utility type character. And, you know, thanks to their druid nature, um, a druid who happens to raise an army of undead skeletons, but still, I just feel like it would it really keeps the character sort of interesting and fresh um, in ways that, that martial characters don't often get a chance to be, I think. And I really like that. I, it really makes them incredibly well-rounded. And I, I just think it would be a lot of fun to role-play as sort of this thing that turns into this raging, you know, beast in combat and it's just frenzied and furiously attacking and then as soon as combat's over they're kind of like oh i'm sorry like how's everybody doing and let me you know i can heal you and take care of you and make everybody's life better and easier um it's got a real cool kind of jekyll and hyde thing going that uh, that i love so anyway that is the show for the week thank you so much for watching please do check out um our social media things and also our um subreddit which is continuing to grow nicely and, and develop a, a great little community. If you have a build that you would like to see me do an episode on, please let me know. Let me know in the comments. That seems to be the easiest way to go right now. Um, I will put it on the list and hopefully sooner rather than later, do my best to optimize it for you. Thanks guys. You're awesome. I love you and uh, hope you have a fantastic day. We will see you in two weeks. And uh, until then, be safe and be good. Goodbye.